what I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders, and today is no different. I'm going to introduce formally in a second, Jason Smith of Spotlight Social Advertising. Before I do, you know, Jason, I always like to mention other guests that people should check out of their episodes. Um, our mutual friend, uh, Jason Swank, I've done two episodes with him. It's fantastic. And um, you know, there's so many other mutual friends, actually, Duncan Olney's been on the podcast and Ian Garlic's been on the podcast uh, and cool. so many others. And, um, I, before I formally choose Jason, this episode is brought to you by rise 25 and Jason, what I tell people is every, almost everything good relationship in my life goes back to a podcast. Okay. We have actually met yes. indirectly because of podcasting, because I got to you know Jason on my podcast joined his mastermind. We're both a part of it. We got to hang out in Colorado and um, it kind of goes back to a podcast. So at Rise 25, we help businesses give to and connect to their dream 100 relationships by helping you run your podcast. You know, for me, Jason, I think you know me a little bit by now. The yeah. number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my relationships. And I found no better way over the past decade to profile the people and the companies I admire and have them on. I get to form a deeper relationship with them throughout the years. So if you've thought about podcasting, you should. Jason has a podcast, which we'll mention as well. So you can check that out. Um, but if you have questions, go to rise25.com and email us. Um, we're happy to answer anything you want. And Jason Smith is the founder and CEO of Spotlight Social Advertising, which he founded in 2016. Before that, he spent 14 years in uniform with the LAPD. <laughs> And later started a side gig helping people with their online traffic and advertising and Facebook ads, which became his core business. And he left the police department permanently to just focus on spotlight social advertising. Uh, Jason, thanks for joining me. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate it. And um, people can check out your podcast um, on your website. What's the podcast called? So people can check yeah, it out. It's called The Truth About Social Ads. So we talk in depth and we kind of we pride ourselves on being super honest like i just recorded a podcast today actually episode about um like what you're responsible for as a facebook agency because we get blamed for a lot of stuff that we shouldn't be getting blamed for like the ads aren't working uh, have you checked your conversion rate on your website it's really crappy you know so stuff like that we try to keep it really real um that's what we call it about that's what we call it the truth about social ads and mm -hmm. just dive in deep to what no one else is talking about so. What else do you get blamed for? Because I could totally see that. Well, we drove, whatever, you know, 10,000 visitors and only one bot. Maybe it's not a traffic problem. Maybe it's a conversion problem. What else do you yeah. get blamed for? Oh, man, I've heard it all. Um, hey, we can't pay our employees. So we need to generate another $50,000 in revenue this month. And I'm like, uh, no pressure. Yeah. Well, I'm like, okay, why is a Facebook agency like even worrying about you can't pay your employees? I don't know. You know, like we've, We've heard it all, you know, or, oh, the face, Facebook ads just aren't working. Well, what do you mean? Well, yeah, we're, we're not making sales. Okay, your website is freaking horrible. Maybe that's why, you know? So yeah, we've got, we've got, we've heard everything under the sun or it's like, hey guys, we need to do 150,000 in revenue uh, this week. Like, okay, we don't have the ability to like, look at your revenue numbers do you want us to give me access to your bank account? Maybe I can look at it, you know, like, so it's things like that, that we get blamed for. It's, it's a little frustrating sometimes because it's like Facebook is kind of the stepchild of traffic. It's like everything gets blamed on Facebook. Oh, the, the dashboard isn't working. Well, your ads are actually working really well. It's gotta be something else. And, you know, we don't, we don't, we're not conversion experts on websites, you know, like we don't do that. We run high quality Facebook traffic and, um, you know, but if you have a good offer and a decent website, we could drive some great stuff, but there's a certain threshold that you, you get to. And these clients love to blame us for not being able to break through that threshold when they don't want to do their part, you know? So I'd love to walk through. And like I said, in the beginning, I don't have set questions. I go wherever sure. you take me and this is where you're taking me, which I love, <laughs> um, which is I want to go through the funnel a little bit and then mistakes people make. So like starting with 
you know, the users looking at a Facebook ad all the way to hitting the website? Cause you have to probably, since you're getting blamed for it, then you have to dig deep into it and go, well, actually, here's your problem. You have, you have to probably sleuth out a lot of problems that are happening that may not even, you're not even responsible for, but, right. but start with the Facebook ad itself. What are mistakes people make with that? And then we can kind of carry through when someone clicks. Yeah. I mean, the biggest mistakes I think is, you know, writing really crappy ad copy and just having horrible creatives, it, you know, stock images do not work. People know what stock images are. They know that, you know, it shouldn't look spammy. Um, you should try to hit people at every stage of the funnel. And what I mean by that is if I've never heard of rise 25 before, um, then you speak to me a certain way. If I've landed on your homepage and I've checked a few things out, you speak to me a certain way, right? Um, if I've added to cart, you're going to speak to me a certain way, you know? Um, and that, that's one of the biggest mistakes I see, like, I'll do, I'll do what we call growth plans all the time on clients that come to us and want to work with us. And, you know, one of the simplest things you can do is just tell people, Hey, I saw you added to cart, come back. We'll give you 10% off your purchase right now. Right? Like instead of writing this long drawn out ad copy, that's the same in the top of the funnel. Um, that's one of the biggest mistakes. People like to be told what to do. Hey, come back and buy today. You get a discount, right? Um, I'm not going to talk to you the same I would as somebody who doesn't know Spotlight Social. You know what I mean? Um, so that's probably one of the biggest mistakes. Um, again, creatives is another big mistake. People think like, oh, I'm just going to like go to iStock Photos and just rip all these like images and put no branding in it, put no logo, like, you know, stuff like that. Videos are very important, but the average watch time for a video right now on Facebook is six seconds. So people are doing these 10 minute videos and like, they're not watching not even 30 seconds of the video, you know, um, you know, doing different ratios because, you know, stories, right. Stories, messenger, all that are different ratio than the Facebook newsfeed. So you got to have different ratios in your ads as well. It can't just be, Oh, we're going to throw this one creative up. Well, and then people wonder like, oh man, we're not getting any purchases from Instagram. Well, if your ratio is off, it's not going to get shown on Instagram or it's not going to get shown on stories or reels or, or whatever. So, you know, you got to be cognizant of that kind of stuff. I would say those are probably the biggest mistakes, um, you know, and then the other big mistake is a really crappy website, <laughs> you know, like, oh, you got to be on top of your conversion rates. You got to look at like as an agency, it's not my job to look at your conversion rate, but I do because I care about conversions. You know, I care about people converting. And, you know, if the Facebook ad has a, a, a click-through rate of 2% and people are engaging and you have an above average engagement rate on your Facebook ads, I will tell you right now, it's not the Facebook ads that are the problem. It's probably something else. And we help dive into that, but we're not... Shopify conversion experts by any means. We're not going to go in and revamp your site and make sure it converts. And because that's another thing we'll get blamed for, <laughs> you know. Um, but we do have some ideas and we do have tons of partners that we work with. We have guys that will charge you $25,000 to redo your website. We have guys that will charge you $4,000, you know, to redo your website. So, um, you know, and we're really trying to get away from working with the I'm only spending $2,000. Well, we don't work with any of those anymore. But and and the other mistake too is not spending enough on Facebook ads. Like people, oh, I'm just going to spend five bucks a day. It's not going to get you anywhere, you know. Um, if you only spend five dollars a day, because you have brands like Target spending a million dollars a day, your ad will never even like make the auction. You know, doesn't matter if you're even if you're in the, a different niche. Like it does not matter. The people who are spending the most on Facebook will get shown first, and then. The people spending less will just get whatever's left over. And that's usually crappy traffic, you know? So where are the different places you send? So let's say it's an e-commerce, um, you know, ad. Where are the different places you tend to send people? Because I know you could send them to a lot of different places. You send them directly to a product page, landing page. I mean, what are some examples of, of places you send people once they click? Yeah, so that, that's, that really, uh, that's kind of like a... Uh, a big controversy, controversy, I guess, because like, you know, and it really depends on the product. Like if it's, if it's an expensive product, 
I need to send them somewhere that's going to explain to them in detail what this product is, right? Um, you know, we had a client um, that recently took their ads in house that had a a spray to get poop and pee out of carpet, right? I don't need to. It's not rocket science, dude. It's like you know, th- this can help get poop and pee out of your carpet <laughs> and your, you know what I mean? It's awesome stuff. It's, it's all natural. It's like, whatever it's there's, you could actually drink it and it like won't hurt you. Like, and it's 20 bucks, you know, I could probably send them to it's a an impulse page. purchase. Yeah. Right. It's an impulse buy. I could probably send them to a product page and be done. Like, dude, I don't need a ton of research on that. You know, it's like a bunch of old ladies who are dog lovers who keep their dogs in their house all day. That's who are buying the products, you know? Um, and I don't need to explain, but like, if you have a, a $2,000 product that you're trying to sell, or even a, a, like we have, um, you know, I'm a big motocross guy, as you know, right. Uh, you know, side by sides, all that kind of stuff, trucks and everything. Well, we have a client, um, that sells really expensive truck bumpers front and rear. And they're awesome, dude. They're like super beefy looking, like really cool. Right. Well, their bumpers start at $700. So I probably can't just send them to the product page and hope that they're going to be like, oh, dude, that's a cool bumper. I'm going to buy it, right? There's a lot more that goes into it. You know, you got to send them to a page that's going to explain like, hey, it's, you know, 516th steel. It's not wimpy, right? Like you got to explain to a welder why this welder, this DIY guy wants to buy this bumper for $700. Um, But I will tell you, we, we on, on average, we get them a five to 10 X return uh, on their ads, you know? Um, and that's because their site's done really well. They've taken our direction on where to go. They've used one of our partners to, to, um, you know, assess how they can better convert on their site, you know, all that stuff. They have taken all the right steps to be able to get there, um, and listen to us and not blamed us for everything under the sun. Um, and, and so you, you know, it really depends. I mean, like I said, and copy is a big difference too. Like on the ads, like I'm going to write a longer form copy for a more expensive product than I am for the, the poop one, right? Like, Hey, you, you want to get your carpets clean? This stuff's all natural. Like really that's all you have to say and people buy it, you know? Um, it's, and it's 20 bucks, you know what I mean? Um, but the $700 bumper is going to take a lot more explanation, even in the ad itself to like convince you to click over Um, you know, there's tons of bumper companies out there right now. Right. But we want to stand out great, creative, um, showcasing really cool trucks that have the bumpers on it. Um, actually my trucks in that gallery as well. So, uh, which more motivation for me to, to really, you know, pump it up, but, um, but yeah, I mean, there, there, it's a variety of things and that's what makes Facebook ads so complicated, right. Is because, you know, you can't just go online got all these guys telling you, oh, spend a thousand dollars. I'll teach you how to run Facebook ads, man. I hate those courses because they don't really teach you anything. It's not tailored to your business. It's just like, Hey, build a bunch of lookalikes and you should get a 10 X return. Well, not really, you know, and Facebook's so much more complicated, especially now with the iOS updates and everything going on with that. Um, you know, but we're still going strong and we've developed a bunch of solutions to, overcome the iOS update and all that. So it's been how good. did the iOS update affect people? Well, so the iOS update, basically, um, you know, Apple um, restricted the data that it could send to Facebook or the, the data that you can track, right? So now when you're on Facebook on your phone, a little window will pop up and say, Hey, do you want Facebook to track your, you know, what you're doing now? Who's going to say yes. Well, yeah, right. Do people but, say but yes. He- I don't know. But here's the other side of the coin too, though, is, and, th- and this is what gets me sometimes is, you know, Facebook tracks you for a reason, right? It's not just because they want to find all this information about you. It's really because so they can tailor your newsfeed experience to Jeremy, right? You're not going to see the same thing in mine as I do, as you do in yours. You know what I mean? So if you want to see all kinds of motocross, wakeboarding, truck bumpers, like all this stuff in your newsfeed, then allow them not to track you, you know? Um, So a lot of people don't think about it that way too. Now on the other side too, Apple is still tracking your every move. They're, They're not the good guys here. They're not doing this, they're not blocking the trackability of a user because they want to, they, they want to, uh, protect your privacy. You know what I mean? 
they're not doing it for that. <laughs> so when people click like, don't allow, they're like, yeah, man, they're not going to get me, you know, well, Apple already has you dude, you know, like, <laughs> like, and, and it's funny because you get in your car to go somewhere and maps pops up on your phone and says, Hey, it's 20 minutes to home, but they're not tracking you. Right. You know, so that, that you got to look at it that way too. And, and, and I would rather have a more tailored experience on Facebook. I want to see ads that I want to see. I want to see things in my newsfeed that, that pertain to me and not to Jeremy. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with what you're looking at, but like you and I have two different, we lead two different lives, you know, and <clears throat> without yeah, the truck bumpers don't excite me. I'd be like, <laughs> why, why is this showing Come on, up? man? You know, <laughs> no, but, um, but yeah, so you know, and, and it's just, it's, it's funny that people think, oh yeah, I'm not being tracked, dude, Google, come on, man. Like if you have a Gmail account or you search on Google, I mean, you've heard the stories. I mean, Google can predict when you're going to get pregnant, even like a year before you're going to get pregnant, you know, that's how much data they're tracking on you, you know? So, but it's, it's a, it's a complicated issue. It also, what it's done because of this restrictive tracking process that Apple has basically told every, and this is, this is across TikTok, Snapchat, Pinterest, like all of them, right? It's not just Facebook. Um, what's happening is like, you're not tracking the full customer journey anymore. You know what I mean? Like if you see an ad today, a Facebook ad about spotlight social, and you're like, man, I need to hire a new Facebook agency. And you see an ad for us and you say, oh man, those guys look pretty good. But then someone came to your front door and you close your phone and you, you forget about it. But then you're like, oh dude, what was that agency spotlight something? You go to Google and you Google spotlight. Well, now because of the changes, like if you go in and buy something from me, like let's say you buy our course for a thousand dollars, right? Well, technically Facebook should get some credit for that, right? Like Facebook introduced you to my brand. So, but now on the Facebook dashboard, it's only doing pretty much like last touch, which is the last activity you had is what Facebook's going to track, um, which is not accurate because there's a whole customer journey behind what you do. You could, you could transfer to your, your tablet and search me there. And then you could leave again and go to your phone again, search me there. Well, that's a customer journey, right? Jeremy isn't just sitting in one place at all times. You're, 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 um, you're dividing your, uh, what you're looking at across multiple devices. We all do that every day. We don't even think about it, you know, <clears throat> or you could grab your wife's iPad, sit in the kitchen counter and go, yeah, spotlight. I want to see that case study, you know, and what it's doing is it's really limiting, um, the way that businesses function on Facebook. Um, the numbers are way off now on the Facebook dashboard and a lot of people are getting frustrated, but Luckily, we've known about this because we're one of the highest levels of Facebook partnership that we've known about this for about a year and a half, almost two years that it was coming down the pipeline. So we, we were trying to partner up with another company that would help us report on all these lost, you know, on this lost attribution, I guess you can say, um, with Facebook. And we've successfully done that. Uh, and it sucks for clients because they got to pay an extra fee but it's either that or not know what's going on with your business on Facebook and Instagram and all the platforms really. Um, so we've successfully done that, which is pretty cool. So Jason, um, you know, you mentioned there's, there's so much to know with <laughs> Facebook is. and Instagram. Yeah. And obviously that's why you specialize in one thing. You don't navigate outside of that, but I'm curious of the different, um, you have different preferred partners for, like you said, you don't do anything Google ads or anything else. Who are some yeah. of the, relationships or partners that are, are key to help your clients? Yeah, for sure. So we have, uh, we have a Google agency. They go, they do Google, YouTube, and Amazon. Um, and it's OMG commerce, OMG commerce.com. Chris Brewer over there is phenomenal. His team is, is awesome. One of the highest level Google agencies that you could get. They only specialize in e-commerce. So if you're not an e-commerce store, they won't talk to you, but but we do have another Google agency that we work with that are, is anything outside of e-commerce, which is Solutions 8. Those guys are awesome as well. Um, and actually, we are, uh, we are now doing Snapchat, TikTok, and Pinterest ads now. So, um, and, and the reason for that was a couple things. A lot of the platforms are very similar in how they function. 
Um, and Facebook was kind of the pioneer behind getting all these other platforms up as well. I mean, just look at what Facebook's accomplished in the ads world and these other, you know, these other platforms are now copying kind of Facebook and how they do things. And so I just thought it would be, you know, a little more sticky for our clients, plus more of a one-stop shop. However, we're not going to do Google. We're not going to do YouTube and we're not going to do Amazon. Uh, we're going to do everything else except for that. Um, but Facebook still is our, our number one platform, our bread and butter. And I still think it's the best platform to advertise on. Tell me about Pinterest because I remember I had someone on and I was astounded by the traffic that Pinterest <laughs> generates. And I was yeah. shocked that right. it was that high. I would, I mean, again, maybe I'm not their demographic, but yeah. talk to me about what you're finding interesting and what type of business should be advertising on, on Pinterest. Well, you know, and that, and that's the funny thing because we've got e-commerce businesses, everything from medical devices to pet, you know, pet industry to truck bumpers to, uh, we even have a client that, that does non-lethal, um, you know, protection devices where they, you can like, you can shoot a pepper ball at, at an intruder and it'll like, you know, it's almost mm. like pepper spray, but you can shoot it at somebody. Right. And it's non-lethal, totally safe. Um, and you know, so we have tons of things we do there. Um, and, and then we've got digital products where we have a company that sells a high level course on how to become uh, successful doing running an Amazon business, you know, we run ads for them. So we've got tons of fitness industry, all on kinds of Pinterest stuff. also. Yeah. So, uh, well, that, that's what I was alluding to. And yeah. a lot of people think, Oh, well, the truck bumper space won't do good on Pinterest because all those dudes are on Facebook and Instagram. Well, not true. Like if you go and search trunk, bu truck bumpers on Pinterest, thousands of stuff will pop up because my initial thought was like, well, let me pick and choose the clients that I think are going to be good on each platform. Right. I learned very quickly that they're all still there. They're all good. There's somebody on every single platform that likes that niche. Right. Um, I mean, you can search stuff from, you know, tattoo cream, you know, I'm covered in tattoos, like how to buy tattoo cream that, that, you know, you can put on so it doesn't hurt when you get tattooed, you know, from, truck bumpers to non-lethal weapons to like recipes like it's so that's what i picture right i'm picturing female recipes, skewed yeah, no. recipes and then not anymore there's some guy with truck bunk I mean, totally <laughs> yeah and i've like, totally stereotyped the platform but i just well, don't go on it that much so yeah well and it's funny because i didn't either um until a few months ago when i'm and and i got hit up by snapchat because they saw the facebook traffic that we run and they're like hey i think you'd be good on on pinterest and i'm like yeah, whatever. But then I looked into it. You search, go, go to Pinterest when go create an account on Pinterest, go search tattoos, right? Thousands of tattoos will pop up there, you know, truck bumpers, thousands of, you know, non-lethal weapons, like recipes, of course, is on there quilting, like all that stuff. Right. You know, but that that's what I'm getting away from is I'm no longer saying, well, they're not going to work on Pinterest because what I think doesn't work always works. It's kind of, <laughs> kind of funny. So what I'm doing is just, we're testing different clients on Pinterest, Snapchat, TikTok, um, and we're seeing which platform works the best for them. And honestly, Jeremy, like I'm very surprised because they're all working well, all of them and, and, and all these different niches and e-commerce and digital products and you name it. There's somebody on each platform that wants that product, you know, um, and as long as your ad is good, it's appealing. Um, you know, like I said, and you know, like with TikTok, TikTok, Pinterest, and Snapchat, there's there's hardly any ad copy. It's like it's like a headline that you write. You know, like best trunk bump, truck bumper ever. You know, in the headline. Um, Facebook ads. That's why Facebook ads is a lot more complicated than these other platforms because you have to write ad copy that pertains with what you're doing um, and stuff like that. So, um, I guess to answer your question don't rule yourself out at any of the platforms, test it out, see if it works for you. And I guarantee you'll probably have some pretty good results. Even if you think your audience isn't on there. So I, I want to dig a little bit deeper so I can understand and people can understand what you do and maybe talk. There was a medical device company and talk mm -hmm. a little bit about that. Yeah. So uh, they came to us. Um, they were referred to us. They had a pretty solid Amazon business when they came to us. Um, they were doing about, 
300K a month in revenue on Amazon um, and uh, came to us and said, hey, we've never run Facebook ads before. We'd like, and we normally don't take on the new like funnels and the new, hey, we want to try Facebook. Well, go hire a smaller agency that can get you some results. And then when you really want to scale, come to us, you know? Um, but they came to us and I kind of liked what I saw. They had a really big Amazon business. And normally I would say, 75, 80% of the time they have a good solid Amazon business. We can make it work on Facebook and Instagram. Um, and you know, the device is about 45, 50 bucks. Um, it basically helps you strengthen your lungs. Uh, it's actually pretty cool. And, um, that comes in handy with COVID I'm sure. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, They, they like blew up on COVID. I mean, they were doing great before COVID, but COVID enhanced their, um, their profitability a little bit, but they came to us, um, You've been working with them now for about two years, but when they initially came to us, they were had never spent a dime on Facebook. We helped them get everything set up, um, went through the the process, created a bunch of ads, tested tons and tons of different variations of copy, um, videos, images, all that stuff. Um, and in about eight months, they were spending about three hundred and fifty k a month at a three x return on Facebook. Uh, so imagine what that would do for your life. If you came to us and said, Hey, we want, this is a cool product. Great. Doing great on Amazon. And then all of a sudden you go from spending, you know, and, and again, your Amazon business is generating about 300 K a month in business. Now we've, we've uh, exceeded their Amazon. They were spending the amount per month in Facebook as of what they were generating a month on Amazon. So imagine spending 300K, getting a 3X return on your investment when you're spending ads on Facebook. Like, I mean, imagine that, you know? And he will never leave us because we've made him a multimillionaire all on Facebook. So that, that's what we do. Like, you know, um, and, and it doesn't always work for everybody. Like, I'm not here to say, guess what? Your company can spend 300 K <laughs> you know what I mean? at a three X return. Like it doesn't work like that for everybody, but if you have a good agency, um, you know, they, they can take you there and it's hard. It's not easy. Like there were months where we were negative, right. On, 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 on return. But he was like, Nope, let's keep going. I really believe in this. I think this can work. Um, you have good months, you have bad months. And then we were already spending 300 K when COVID hit, right. Then COVID hit. And unrealistic numbers were coming in, like numbers that that you can't rely on as your norm is what I mean, you know. So we knew that this was going to be short lived. So you know, with, there was a couple months where we spent almost six hundred k a month, and he was just killing it, you know. Uh, so that those kind of success stories, we have. We also have a, a couple of Facebook published case studies that were really cool. Like Facebook came to us and said, "Hey." You're doing some really cool stuff. Like we want to highlight your, your agency and your client. Um, and, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to get those because Facebook's very picky and who they're going to pick to like, to, to highlight, you know? Um, and, and we were lucky enough to, to have two of them now. So it's pretty, pretty cool. So. One thing, you know, about, you know, running a company is it takes a team. And we were chatting before yes. we hit record on it's critical to bring on good team members. And so what are your thought process and how you bring on and keep good team members? Yeah. So I, you know, I think I, when you and I were in Durango, I shared a little bit of our, our process and how we bring on solid people and kind of one thing for us anyways, in our industry and what we do kind of made the difference for us. Um, and I think it can be used all over the place, but, um, I mean, you know, solid team members are, are, are crucial, especially in my world, because they've got to deal with clients. They've got to deal with a lot of stress. We get blamed for a lot of stuff. Like we said before, it's stressful. It's not easy. Facebook ad world is always changing. So there's always changes we have to keep up with. Um, and, and how we, I think, got to the point where we were bringing on really good people Um, was one simple thing. And that was having them record a video um, and giving them a certain task and telling them, hey, you have six minutes to record this video. Show me what you're doing inside of Facebook Business Manager. 
and I can tell within three seconds they know what they're doing or not. You know, now on a resume and on a Zoom call like you and I are on right now, I could bullshit you all day. Oh, yeah, I've done this, I've done that. But until I'm actually in the platform navigating my way around, that's when I know if you're going to be good or not, you know, mm-hmm. and how they explain things, how they articulate. Uh, and that's what we've used for the last few months now. And it's been a game changer. Like, you know, I, um, I, I got in a pretty bad motorcycle accident recently and I broke my wrist in six places and um, did not have to worry about my team. Like that was the, one of the biggest releases of business owner is if you, if something happens to you and you have to go away for a while, like what is your team going to do when you're gone? Well, I can tell you six months ago, I'd be worried really worried, (laughs) you know, but in the last four months, three months, like literally right before I broke my wrist where I just couldn't be there because I, you know, I had to have surgery. I was laid up. I broke two ribs and, you know, I couldn't be sitting at my desk. Um, I didn't have to worry, man. It was, it was freaking awesome. Like one of the best feelings in the world is not having to worry about your team. You know, I mentioned, thanks for sharing that Jason, that that is powerful just to observe someone doing whatever it is they're doing, not just saying it is, is the key. And so that could apply to anyone. You know, I mentioned the LAPD, right? Um, I mean, I could talk for two hours and hear your stories on the LAPD, but (laughs) um, I wanted to hear, you know, some business stuff first. And, um, you know, how did you even get started doing this in the first place? Right. I mean, you're LAPD, you're, you know, neck deep in this stuff. How did that yeah. even start? Yeah. So, well, you know, when I was a policeman and, you know, I, I chronicle some of this on my podcast as well. If you want to go take, a, you know, another listen a uh, little bit more into detail, And actually um, your partner too, I, I went pretty depth uh, with another, in another episode on rise 25 about my career and as a policeman. And um, but, you know, it was funny because when I got introduced to this um, I had actually gotten in trouble um, well, I wouldn't consider trouble. I thought I was doing my job. Right. And I get benched. We called it bench. So you can't go out in the field and you got to like hand out equipment. And one of my buddies, and I actually got relieved, relieved of duty, which means that I had to stay home for a little bit until they figured out if I did what I did in this incident was correct. Right. Um, which it still boggles my mind that like, you're wearing a badge, you're an honest policeman. And they can just relieve you of duty. You know, it's crazy. Um, so I was, you know, in some trouble at the time I was benched and one of my buddies came to me and said, Hey dude, I know you got some time on your hands. Um, I, I heard about this Facebook ad stuff, no clue what I'm doing. Do you want to like help me out? And I'm like, dude, if you don't know what you're doing, I have no clue what I'm doing. He had a supplement company at the time selling like proteins and stuff like that. So I'm like, yeah, sure. Let's, let's, you know, what I got time on my hands. I'm home doing nothing. Might as well, you know, see what's up. So I, I, uh, and and this is when I discovered that I'm a little bit creative because I helped them write some ad copy and we put up some images and then all of a sudden he started getting sales like from these ads. And I was just like, oh my gosh, this is pretty cool. Um, I can't believe you made like 30 grand last month. I'm like, holy crap. Like there's more to this than, than what meets the eye, I guess. And so then I started Googling and just researching Facebook ad agencies, how to become this and how to have your own agency. And I stumbled across this really high level course. Um, and I ended up investing like $15,000 in this course. Um, and I went to this training, changed my life forever. That's, that, a, that's what made you here. make that leap. Because I mean, that's for some people that's um, a large chunk of their annual take home, you know? So you, well, it's a large chunk, but you have to remember what I'm making now compared to what I made as a full-time policeman. <laughs> you, making $4,000 a month is not a lot, right? That's about how much I was making. Four to $5,000 a month. Like, and, and the reason why I was looking, and I'm glad you brought this up because I, I, like, I don't like to you know, bag on police departments or policemen in general. They're, they're, most of them are great guys. Um, departments aren't great. It's very political. And, you know, as you can see by all the stuff going on in the news right now, like dudes are getting fired before they can even find out what's going on in these incidents, you know, but I, I, I had been in three shootings. Um, I had been sued in federal court 
three or four times. Uh, I was never home. Uh, I was always at work. I'd spend days at work because I was an aggressive policeman. So I'd get in these crazy incidents and shootings and all this stuff. And, um, you know, after being in a couple shootings and then being sued in federal court and having LAPD say, Hey, you may have to pay for punitive damages. I don't know if you know what punitive damages are in federal court, but basically punitive damages means that, um, the vic, the so-called victim of gang members who shot at me first are their family suing the department and they're suing you personally for $850,000 in punitive damages. We may not be able to cover that. And I'm sitting here going, wait a second, I'm a policeman doing good police work, very aggressive, right? Doing my job. I'm sorry if I'm chasing after gang members, they shoot at me first. So in order for me not to die, I have to, you know, use lethal force so I don't die. Um, and there's something wrong with that, you know? And, and, and at the time, Facebook was going through, a, this was when the, the market was really crappy and Facebook wasn't even paying officers for overtime. And uh, they were just broke. And they said, we may not be able to cover these punitive damages if they win, right? Um, and I'm sitting back going... <laughs> And, and, and this was like two months in federal court of testimony and trial and them like, you know, why did you run this way and not this way? You know, I'm like, when someone's shooting at you, are you going to think about all these little tiny things? No, you're not like you're, you're going to react, you know, based on your training. So um, I was just looking for a way out. Not many officers do. And a lot of guys get stuck in that job thinking there's, they can't do anything else, but I'm a perfect example of, I worked there for almost 14 years, right? Like a few more years and I would have, I would have had 20 years in the job, you know? And if I would have stayed, I would have had, I think 20, 25 years in the job now, if I would have stayed, you know? Um, and I saw a door open and I just was like, man, I'm so tired of the politics here. I'm tired of getting in trouble for doing my job. If the public only knew that they really don't want you out there chasing gang members and cleaning up the streets, like, there'd be mass pandemonium because they don't, you know, because it causes lawsuits and paperwork and all this stuff. And uh, so I was looking for a way out. I'm like, man, I got to get out of here. Like, and not only that, I've, you know, I've got a lot of stories, but um, one story that really made me after my shootings. And then what happened was a, a gang put a green light on me. So they wanted me dead. And, um, and after that, I'm like, man. And then after this happens, I had a little run in with another gang um, and I almost got killed coming through a door in a little bar where they slang dope and have prostitution and stuff in, in East LA. Um, and believe it or not, a crackhead saved my life because I gave her a break one time and she had some dope on her. And I said, listen, as long as you give me some info every once in a while, keep your dope. I don't care. Like I care about gang members and guns, you know, and some gang members stiffed in a call um, on a pretty bad neighborhood in East LA and this gang that I've been dealing with for years. And, um, I was working by myself that night call comes out. They knew I was working. They called the station to see if I was working to make sure I was working. And of course, dumb policemen at the desk are like, Oh yeah, Smith's working tonight. You know, <laughs> it's like, come on, dude. Why would somebody ask for an officer? You know? Um, anyways. So, uh, then I, I, I hear this call go out. My, my MO as a policeman was I parked four or five blocks away so they couldn't see that I was coming, walk up on this location, and, and, and she stopped me um, about 40 feet from the door. And she said, hey, if you walk in that door right now, they're going to kill you going through the door. And I'm like, nah, dude, you know, your pride kicks in and you're like, nah, dude, I'm, I know these streets, like I know what's up. And she's like, no, and I could see the look on her face was like pale white. She's like, I couldn't live with myself knowing that you got killed going through the door. And I knew about it because she had just scored some dope from that bar. So she knew she saw the gang members in there and they were talking about it uh, and they didn't know she knew me, you know, just because I gave her one break, you know? Uh, and sure enough, I surrounded the place. We ended up recovering uh, about 15 rifles from the location. 20 gang members were there, 15 handguns, all kinds of dope. Um, and just because that lady, and she was old too. She was in her, in her, fifties, you know, run down like crackhead, you know, 
Um, she didn't have to do that for me, but, and, and then after that, I was like, okay. And even my wife was like, okay, you're going to get killed out there. Like you need to like, you need to, we need to try to formulate some sort of exit strategy. Cause I firmly believe if I would have stayed, I'm just, I was an aggressive policeman and I had that green light on me. And then this happened and, you know, I've been shot at several times. I would have died out there for sure. Like they, no matter what I think as a policeman, they would have got the best of me at some point, you know, uh, and I would have died for sure. So I'm, I, I'm glad I, I got out when I did and not everybody's story is going to be this extreme and you know, all this stuff, but <clears throat> just the fact that you're a policeman and you're just going, going with emotions, it's no way to live. And you don't, I mean, you know, my, my first couple months as an agency owner making $10,000 a month, like that changed my life, you know, changed my life. And I never would have made that kind of money as a policeman. I don't care if I would have been there, you know, all day, every day working overtime, you still can't make that kind of money, you know? And then me chasing gang members, getting shot at, getting a green light, making $80,000 a year for what, you know, for, for the police department who doesn't even like support you, you know? Um, so, so yeah. Anyways, <clears throat> I get PTSD hearing your, some of your <laughs> stories, um, that we, that you shared, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. One I mean, day you'll have a book, right? <laughs> come out with some stories. Yeah, I think so. I think yeah, we, we definitely need to talk about that for sure. But yeah. And I still have dreams, you know, I'm chasing after a gang member and my, my gun doesn't go off. I get killed and, you know, so, and that's part of just being out there and being, you know, being in these violent situations every, like literally every night, you know, I was chasing somebody and I'd walk into roll call and guys are like, dude, you're here. It's going to be an awesome night, you know, cause Smith's here going to get into something, you know? Um, so, but uh, I mean, it, it was fun. It was, it was a fun job, but it's not worth it. I don't it's know if worth- I would call it fun, but that that's your, your cup of tea. <laughs> I mean, you, you know, I was just, yeah. I was, you know, it's funny. You, you go, I look for trouble every night you look for the worst of the worst in Los Angeles every night, you know? Uh, and that's what I like to do. Um, and, it, but it just wears on you mentally. You know, my wife and I got divorced and then, and then like after I left and you know, all that stuff, it, it, it's very hard on your personal life as well. You got to keep things inside that you don't necessarily want to keep inside. Like, you know, I'm not going to go tell my wife that, you know, I almost got killed going through a door, right. From a bar. I told her way after the fact, but like, like, I'm not going to go home and tell my wife that, you know, and my, and at the time my wife didn't know what type of policeman she thought I was out there writing tickets, you know, like I didn't tell her that I was chasing gang members out all night long and getting into shootings and being shot at and getting into some really crazy fights with gang members and almost not coming home, you know, but that's what I did. And, and, and it, there, there's certain consequences for, for me being that way as a policeman. So you have, uh, this, your dad was in the FBI. Yes. So I wanted to hear maybe a lesson or two that you learned from him. Well, the first lesson was don't become a policeman. And I didn't listen. <laughs> <laughs> that's what he told you. Yeah. Yeah. He was like, well, why don't you try like DEA FBI and I'm like, nah, dude, you guys are wimps, man. Like, all you do is sit around at a desk all freaking day. You know, I want to like fight dudes, you know? And uh, he's like, okay, you know, good luck. And then he's like, well, why don't you get a job at a smaller department? You know, that like is not as busy. But of course, here I am 22 years old. What do I want to do? I want to like work in LA, you know, the busiest police department in the world. You know, I want to work there. Um, And to give you an idea, you know, like my first area that I, that I was a probationary officer in 275 homicides in a six square mile radius. That's not violent. Crazy. Is it? You know, and that's all gang violence, you know? So, um, but, uh, but yeah, anyways, it, it's, it's crazy because um, you just like, you don't realize what's going to happen. And then my dad, I didn't listen to my dad. He's like, dude, you're going to be confronted with stuff that you're never going to be able to take back. Right. And yes, as an FBI agent, you know, my dad will even say it too. Like very few times are you are you put in these situations like I was in and it's more of this like upper echelon law enforcement agency. But my dad's like, you do a lot of standing around, 
my dad actually worked on a lot of really cool cases um, and um, a couple really famous ones actually. But, but uh, you know, you don't listen to, you know, I'm a 22 year old kid. Like I want to be in the action and stuff. And then, you know, 10 years later, I'm like, you know what, you're right, dad. I should have <laughs> maybe explored another option or, or whatever. And, but it is what it is. I mean, everything works out for a reason. Um, and, and my dad told me too, he's like, you need to finish school before you do this. And I didn't didn't finish college. Um, and I should have, I should have finished college, probably went FBI, DEA, secret service, something like that. But I wanted to be a hard charging gunslinger policeman in LA. Uh, and it comes with certain consequences when you do that. So, um, but my dad's a very knowledgeable guy. Have you ever heard of Falcon in the snowman? Mm -mm. Uh, well, Google it, or there's a movie on Falcon in the snowman. They were two famous bank robbers and my dad's the one that arrested them and he's in the book and the movie and all that mm. stuff. So it's pretty, pretty cool. Falcon and the snowman. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and my, cause my dad worked bank robberies for a long time. He actually worked counterintelligence for a long time too. And you know, it was, it was funny getting off track here for a second, but um, when I was, I think I was 15 or 16, this was way before nine 11, obviously um, my dad, on Christmas Eve had to rush out and form like this task force because um, he, and you know, I can tell this now cause he's retired cause before it was all classified. Um, but uh, uh, Osama bin Laden came to town unannounced to Los Angeles and oh. they had to go follow him. Yeah. And um, you know, this was way before, you know, but they, that Osama bin Laden had been on their radar for many, many years and he just like showed up unannounced in the U S so they had to form a task force and go follow him. So, you know, stuff like that, I think back on, I'm like, geez, you know, that's crazy. And then when nine 11 hit, you know, off, off air, I could tell you a couple things that my dad told me about nine 11 and stuff that were pretty shocking, but, uh, cause I can't, I can't really say that right now. Cause he's entrusted me. It's like classified information, but yeah, it's crazy, man. Uh, my dad's a great guy. Uh, one of my role models, definitely one of my heroes. And, um, he's a, he's a good man. Yeah. So, yeah. Thanks for sharing that. It's yeah. crazy. Um, <laughs> you know, last, I have one last question, yeah. um, Jason, it's sort of, a maybe a couple questions bunched into one, but mm -hmm. before I ask it, uh, I want to point people towards spotlight social advertising.com check out, um, your website and there is a podcast tab too. You could check out their podcast. So are there any other places online we should point people towards? No, that's it. I mean, go to our homepage. You can, if you, if you want to reach out to us, we got a contact section there. Just click on that. And uh, one of us will, will get back to you, but um, yeah, that's, that's the main, our main hub there. <clears throat> Last question, Jason, I always, you know, I find this super interesting because there's always a story behind this, which is um, you mentioned earlier tattoos. Mm -hmm. I love for you to kind of explain a couple of your tattoos and, and there's always a story behind why. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, I think, uh, so my knuckles are tattooed, right. As you can see right there and my, my knuckles, it's funny. People will stare at them and like, not ask me, you know, it's so funny. It's just like this taboo thing, I guess. I don't know. It's, and it's fine. I'll go into my, my daughter's class or something and people stare at my hands, you know, and very few people will say, Hey, what does that mean? And, and, um, you know, it's, it's, it, and I'm actually a pretty cool guy. I may look like a dick, you know, but I'm, I'm actually pretty <laughs> cool, <laughs> you know? Um, but I, no. I wouldn't say that I would say, you know, when you, when someone meets you, you are, you can look a bit intimidating just by, you have a long beard, you have some tattoos. I mean, just not saying yeah. you are, but it's no. Yeah. It's and just, I'm, I, you yeah. know, I'm, I'm about you and I are about, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to mess with you or meet you in a, in a dark alley. Let's say that, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. I'd be well, like, uh, I gotta, I gotta go. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, well, and that kind of brings me to this point is, so my knuckles say true pain. And I, I got that very early on, um, you know, on the police department because, uh, and you know, I've always been kind of like, uh, a, a little bit of a jerk. Like I like fighting, you know, I like those stressful situations and where, like when you inflict pain on somebody, where does it come from? It comes from your hands, right? Even when you shoot a gun, it's not the gun. 
it's the person pulling the trigger, right? People blame guns like, oh, we need gun. You know, it's not the gun. It's the actual person behind that firearm that's pulling the trigger. And, you know, I, I used to be not so much of a nice person. I used to get into a lot of fights, like, you know, just wherever. And so that, to, to me, when I got those tattoos, it reminds me of, you know, someplace that I uh, kind of, not a dark place, but like, I like fighting, you know, like, you know, you wanted to pick a fight with me, I'll, you know, tune your ass up, you know, <laughs> like that's just the way it was. And, uh, and it reminds me that, I've come so far from that too. You know, every time I look at my hands, um, I think, geez, man, like, you know, own a successful agency. Uh, yes, I may not look like the normal, you know, Facebook uh, business person over here, you know, long beard, uh, you know, tattoos and stuff. But, but, um, you know, I'll, I'll outwork anybody. Who wants anybody. to be normal anyway? Yeah, yeah exactly. Right. <laughs> Um, I'll outwork anybody. I, I'm, I can run with the best of them. And, you know, I'm a pretty intelligent guy just because I have tattoos and a long beard doesn't mean I'm a dumbass, you know? Um, so, uh, and I also like proving that as well. Like I look a certain way and that just goes to show. And I know this more than anybody, you cannot judge a book by its cover, right? Like even when I went into that Facebook training, I showed that, that I told you about that opened the door to this whole Facebook agency world for me. Like I was like walked in with my flannel. My beard was like way longer at the time. I had super long hair and I'm like walk into this room with all these dudes and like collared shirts and clean shaven. And, you know, but I proved a point at the end. And that was like, if, you know, I'm an action taker and tell me what to do, I'll put it into action and I'll, and I'll do it better than anybody else in the room, you know? So, yeah. True pain. True pain, man. <laughs> cool. Yeah. <laughs> Jason, I'll be the first one to thank you. Um, everyone check out spotlight, social advertising.com. Check out more episodes of inspired insider, check out rise 25 and thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Appreciate it, man. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. Seems like a beach if you find the sand right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand.